Ready? Five, four. Okay, I'm talking. All right, so thanks everybody for coming out today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Angular 2. Uh, I'm going to be talking about why I'm excited about it. I'm going to be talking about some things that initially put me off a little bit, but then I learned more. And then I'm going to be digging in with lots and lots of code. Uh, so this is an almost beta sneak peek. And Angular is, for the most part, doing everything out in the open. Uh, and it's, it's really easy to track what's going on. And there's a, a website that's uh, worth showing that's basically just using the GitHub API and is tracking every day what the progress of Angular 2 is. So um, they have a bunch of issues. And you can go look at the milestones in GitHub and drill into the issues. Uh, and see which issues are tagged beta zero and must be closed before beta is launched. Uh, I've been noticing that the progress of this has picked up a good bit in the last week or two. And my guess, based on how that's looking, is that they're targeting the end of the year. Uh, I don't know if they'll get there or not. That's pretty soon. Uh, but, you know, it was at 50% just a couple weeks ago. So they've really accelerated their progress. Um, so that's sort of my best guess as far as when we'll see beta. However, um, everything there, um, it, it feels more and more stable as far as like playing with it and things working and, and not breaking down for the most part. Uh, I am like one version behind the current alpha. Uh, I did run into an issue specifically with alpha 48. I'm at alpha 47 for all the stuff that I'm going to show you. Uh, but the features are there. Uh, the API, I think, is pretty much solidified. I don't think they're going to do any major breaking changes. I'd be really surprised if they did at this point. Uh, so it's totally a good time, in my opinion, to start digging in and seeing how things work and getting a feel for it. So um, I'm really excited about Angular 2. It, it felt like you know there's been a lot of um, you know bad press for Angular 2. I think it's you know the way that they went about announcing things was really unfortunate. Uh, but I'm really excited about it. Uh, I feel like it takes a lot of things and learns from Angular 1. Uh, and it takes a lot of things that were in Angular 1 and then became web standards. And then it reincorporates them into Angular 2 using the web standards. Uh, and I think that's actually really cool. Uh, it ends up that the API and, and stuff is a little bit different. Um, but I feel like overall, it's definitely a big step forward. Um, I feel like Angular really brings well thought out solutions to um, a lot of the, the things that you're going to need as you build a complex web app. But at the same time, it doesn't, it's not overly prescriptive and I never feel boxed in. Uh, I've used other frameworks where I felt like if they didn't have a solution to my problem, things got really hard. Whereas Angular still adopts the philosophy of, here are all the pieces we think you're going to need based on the experience building complex web apps. Here's an easy way to work together with them. But if you, if you want to go a different way, leave a piece out. It's not going to get in your way. Um, I feel like it's still very much focused on simplicity and you know, embracing JavaScript, embracing HTML, CSS, the DOM, and not trying to do something different. Um, and I just, I just still like it. Um, so there's some specific things that I've been really excited about that are coming with Angular 2. Uh, I've been tracking web components for a really long time, and I've been super excited about them. When I first started doing web development in 1996 or so, I was really bummed that I couldn't create my own HTML tag. I learned HTML. I was like, OK, I know HTML. That's great. But what if I want to make an element to do something different? And then I found out I couldn't unless I wrote my own browser, and I was really sad. Um, so fast forward almost 20 years, and finally, we can do what I wanted to do in 1996. So I only had to wait 20 years, so that's awesome. Uh, but no, seriously, uh, I feel like web components are basically bringing uh, the awesome things in directives and making them a standard. Um, and uh, you know, uh, I've been hearing most of the frameworks are going to be adopting web components. Uh, I'm not sure what their progress is on it, but Angular really kind of takes the, the path of completely embracing web components. And where you used to have controllers and directives, and sometimes it was hard to figure out which one to use, 
everything's a web component in Angular 2. Your app itself that you start with is going to be a web component. And we'll see that in a second. Uh, the other thing that I'm really excited about is it really embraces uh, ES2015 and beyond. Uh, instead of Angular modules, you just have modules because now there's a proper module system in, in ES2015. So everything you write uh, embraces the module system of JavaScript, which uh, is a huge improvement on the language uh, as far as I'm concerned. It was one of those things where it was just a missing piece that we've been hacking around for a really long time. And having it be part of the language is great. Uh, and I, I've been digging into this more recently, and I'll show you an example of it. But I'm really excited about observables. Observables are a spec that's coming in. Uh, it's on the standards track for ES 2016 or ES 7. Uh, and it is similar to promises, but for things that can emit uh, repeating values. So a promise, you say, OK, then, and it resolves and gives you back a result. But if you have something that can emit uh, 0 to n results over time, something that will emit more results over time, uh, observables are a really nice solution to that. Uh, and uh, they're, you know, like I said, they're on their standards track. Uh, Angular is completely embracing them. and. They make some really awesome things possible and elegant. And I'll, I'll show you an example that I've been playing with with that. Um, so there are a few things that uh, I think Angular 2, um, the way that they went about you know, developing it, and it's really more talking about it, kind of gave them a black eye. And I feel like it's really unfortunate, because the way it's shaking, shaping up is actually looking pretty good. Uh, and that specifically is that top one, the lack of a clear upgrade path. When they first started with Angular 2, they basically said, hey, we want to rethink things. We want to embrace the web standards that are coming along. So we're going to look at Angular 2 as a chance to like, do things differently from the ground up. And, every, and they said, hey, you know, the immediate question from the community is, what, what does that mean if I'm learning Angular 1? What will the upgrade path be like? And basically their answer was, we don't know yet. We'll figure it out. And everybody took that to be, there won't be an upgrade path. And I'm just going to be like, all my work is going to be flushed down the toilet or something. And it's time to abandon ship. Um, well, it's now it's getting closer. And they've come up with an upgrade adapter that looks really pretty good. And I'll, I'll walk you through the API. And the examples are there uh, in the Angular 2 repository. And you can start checking it out. But it provides a pretty clear solution for how you can gradually take an Angular 1 app and move it to Angular 2. So I feel like that issue has been addressed actually pretty well. It's just you know what they said was, well, it was the truth. We'll figure it out later. And then they did actually follow through and figure out a pretty solution. But at this point, they've already kind of taken their lumps, which is unfortunate. Um, the other thing that I, and this isn't, I don't know if the community reaction to this was, was kind of mixed. but. Um, TypeScript uh, is not required to use Angular 2 at all, but they've really embraced um, TypeScript in terms of making it really easy to um, build an Angular 2 app using TypeScript. And there's some specific features um, of TypeScript that are on the standards track for ES7 and beyond. Uh, decorators is the specific feature that, that I'll show you that are just really nice for building an Angular 2 app. And I'll show you what they look like uh, and, and why they work the way they do. Um, but my initial reaction was TypeScript. I, I just wasn't excited about it. Um, but as I've used it and as I've worked with it, I've, I've really enjoyed it, actually. So um, it was, again, one of those things where it was like, initially, I don't know how I feel about that. But when I tried it, I was like, hey, this is pretty cool. Um, so the other thing that kind of put me off is they've changed the way the, temp the attributes, uh, the HTML attributes that tell Angular to do stuff. They've changed the way they work, and they've added some syntax that at first looked really, really weird. But like anything else, it's just kind of new. And when you get used to it and understand what it does, um, it doesn't bother me so much now. So. Um, what I'm going to do next is jump into a bunch of code examples. Uh, I'll start with like a really simple Angular app that I'll just sort of code live. Uh, and you know, if I get uh, off into the weeds, I do have it pre-coded, and I can just get reset to that branch 
and that'll be fine. But I do want to at least give you an, a feel for what it looks like to create an Angular 2 app from scratch, because it, it's actually pretty good. Uh, so I'm going to show you what it looks like to make a simple Angular 2 component. I'm going to show you some examples of the weird attribute syntax and what it does. Uh, I'd like to show you dependency injection, uh, observables, uh, routing, and upgrade adapter. So that's a lot of stuff. I hope I have time to get through all of it, but I do have examples, and I'll point you where to go to actually look at these examples for yourself. A good portion of them are actually in the Angular 2 repo, and it's really easy to get it up and running yourself, which I think is pretty cool. So let's jump right in. Um, so what I have here is I have the skeleton for an Angular 2 app. Uh, Angular 2 doesn't mandate a specific approach for building an app. There's a really good tutorial on the Angular 2 website that walks you through building an app. Uh, I'm going to use a slightly different approach than they used. Uh, I'm going to be using something called JSPM. Uh, just curious, how many people are familiar with JSPM at all? So, like, wow. Okay, so that's totally fine. I, I wish JSPM got more press because I'm really excited about JSPM too. JSPM is a package manager that really embraces system JS, which is um, hopefully going to be uh, the standard JavaScript module loader of uh, ES 2015. So ES 2015 has standardized, this is how modules work in JavaScript, but they never quite standardized, this is how to load and resolve JavaScript modules, and that's kind of unfortunate. But System.js brings that to the table and has a spec for this is how to load uh, ECMAScript modules, uh, and JSPM is a package manager based around that. Uh, it, it's kind of a meta package manager in that you can load packages from NPM or from Bower or from, I think there's even another one, but it, it, it will let you use packages already existing from different sources. So I'm really digging JSPM and that's what I'm going to use here. Um, so at this point, I'm starting with basically an empty app with nothing in it. Uh, all I have is the, I'm loading system.js and I'm loading my config that config is something that JSPM manages that tells it where to find packages and stuff. Uh, so I'm gonna build my app in TypeScript and I'm gonna start with making a very simple Angular 2 component and basically just start with kind of a hello world type app. So I have a source subdirectory and I'm gonna make a component because apps in Angular 2 are components and I'm gonna call it CincyJS app. Uh, and I'm gonna be using TypeScript, so I, I name it .ts. And um, like I said, Angular 2 totally adopts the, um, the module system of ECMAScript 2015. So the first thing that I do is I import the stuff that I need in my app. And the things that I need to get started are component and bootstrap. Oh yeah, thank you. How's that? Is that better? One more? Are people able to see that okay? Okay. So I'm gonna import the things I need from the Angular 2 package. And component, this is a decorator. Sometimes uh, you'll hear me call these annotations because I'm coming from Java and that's job, the Java language calls them annotations. But basically they are w a way to express metadata. Uh, and in this case, what I'm saying is I want to give some extra metadata about the class that I'm about to write. I'm gonna write an ES6 class called CincyJS app. And that ES6 class doesn't need to extend anything because I'm telling Angular 2 the information that it needs, rather than having to inherit from a base class, I'm using the annotation to tell Angular 2, hey, this is a component. And that component needs a couple things to start with. It needs a template, and rather than put it in a template, uh, putting my template in a separate file to start with, I'm just gonna do it in line. And the other thing that it needs is a selector. 
the selector says what this uh, component actually applies to. So we're going to make a custom element because that's kind of the convention. And I'm going to say this custom element is cincyjs-app. And this component manages cincyjs-app, excuse me. So the other thing I need to do is use Bootstrap. Bootstrap is basically just telling Angular 2, here's how to start my app. And I'm saying, in this case, the root of my app is this component. Yes. Am I missing? Oh, I totally am. Thank you. Live coding is terrible, and you should never do it. Also, I don't need to put that in quotes. I was just really liking quotes for some reason. So yes, anybody else see anything obviously silly that I've done? Feel free to shout it out. OK, so on the Angular side, I've made a very simple component with a template. I've told it what selector it applies to. And there's actually a couple things that I forgot to do here. So as of right now, there's a couple other packages that I need to bring in for Angular 2 to be happy. And I'm hoping this is kind of an artifact of not being released yet, because I feel like I shouldn't have to bring these in myself. But right now, I do. So I have a very simple component. And now what I should be able to do is I need to add a script tag that uses system.js and imports my module to start my app. What's that? Sister. Is that what you meant? And hopefully I've gotten that right. And then the last thing I should need to do is that. And if I've gotten everything right, I should just be able to, and I'll give you some font bump love there too, I should be able to fire up live server, which is just a, a little tiny live reloading web server. And obviously I haven't gotten it right on the first try. Um, I think I spelled system.js wrong. Yeah. I think it's that. Man, I've done this so many times, you'd think I'd get that right. You know what? I think that's enough watching me struggle with the live coding. I'm going to get reset hard master and go with the code that I know works already. And now we see a very simple list. And that's a list of a couple elements. And let's go through and see what that looks like. So first of all, Oh, man, it was just system.import. Bah! Oh, well, that's OK. So this is what I meant to type here. It was pretty close, but I messed it up. And at this point in the code base, I've actually broken down into multiple components. So let me show you what's going on here. It's pretty close to what I have before. It's just gotten a little bit more interesting. I basically moved my template out into a separate HTML file. And I added some data into my class here. So in a lot of ways, your class here is, is like your controller was in Angular 1. And it's just as simple to work with. You set data on it, and it's available inside of your template. So in this case, we just have two peeps. They have a name and an age. And inside of our template, 
we are going to loop over them. So here's an example of some new template syntax in Angular 2. Um, this star weird prefix for the attribute, this is basically telling Angular this is a element that can be uh, cloned multiple times. And under the covers, it's actually going to be using HTML templates, which are a feature that's like a sub-spec of web components. And it's basically a way to just do templates as part of the language itself rather than using a separate templating framework. So it's basically going to see this, turn it into a template, and stamp it out as many times as I have peeps in that list. Uh, this is what sets up basically a local variable for person. And in here, I've broken this out into a detail component, which I'll show you as well. And I'm passing the person into that detail component. This syntax here with a square bracket is basically saying this is a binding. And rather than just like passing in a, a text value, I want to, inside that detail component, I want to set its peep property to the person object at that point in the template. So it used to be when you defined directives in Angular 1, you were saying, this is what I want the attributes to mean and how they should work. They flip that around to say basically as the user of a component, I'm telling the component this is how I want to use the attributes to pass things in. So I do that, it's, it's just flipping those responsibilities. And for me, I, the reason that they did that is it was always confusing. When you were using a component, especially if it was a third party directive, you were never sure like, whether this was an attribute where you passed in something that was you know, a string or passed in something that was a binding to the parent scope. It was always confusing. But now it's totally clear because you're specifying how it works and how to bind it. So this peep detail component, he's a, a little bit simpler. He has one property peep and this input annotation basically says, this is like a bindable property. And that's how I'm interacting with it from the outside. This template is just an inline template that displays the name and the age from that peep that's coming in. And that peep detail selector just says, here's the element to match on. So that's you know still a, a pretty simple app. I have a outer component for the app and an inner component that displays the detail for each peep. So is there any way to put some type safety in peep to say you have to pass in something with the name and use that type Yeah, you, you totally could. You could basically have a type here that was peep if I made a class and so forth. Yeah, you could totally enforce type constraints on it. Yep, absolutely. Any other questions on this so far on the basics of writing an Angular 2 app, making a component. <coughs> Anything you want me to show again before I start looking at some other stuff? All right. Um, so let me go back to my slide and kind of walk through, oops, walk through what I wanted to show in order. Um, so next I'm going to walk you through a, also a pretty simple app that I wrote, and I'm actually going to do a screencast series walking you through creating it step by step here pretty soon. That's kind of in the work, so um, for those that are interested. But it's an Angular 2 app that talks to a Phoenix backend, and uh, it, it allows me to leverage in Angular 2 some really cool features of Phoenix, and I'll show you that now. So let me stop. Uh, if I didn't already, let me stop the server I had over here. And, and I'm going to start up the server inside of my Things app. And I'm going to show you what that does. Let's get a font bump. And then I'm going to go to that same 
app running at 8080. And this is a really simple app. It's like even simpler than a to-do list. It's just a list of things. That's all it is. Um, it is persistent to a back end. And the other thing about it is it's real time in that all the connected browsers, as soon as I add a thing, it's going to show up in both. So the things that I was interested in figuring out with Angular 2 and Phoenix is how do I talk to a REST API and how does that code work? And how do I actually work with Phoenix channels to have data broadcast across multiple clients? So uh, I feel like the answers I came up with as, as problems were, were pretty nice and I was pretty happy with the results. So let's look at some code. And I'm, I'm just going to focus on the Angular 2 side. Uh, the screencast will go through both sides if you're interested in the Phoenix side as well. Um, so let's take a look at the app itself. And there's a few more features of Angular that this will introduce you to. Um, one of the first things that you'll see right at the beginning is the way that dependency injection works in Angular 2. Dependency injection works by in the constructor for my component class, I declare a parameter with a given type. And Angular will see that type and match it against providers that it knows about. In this case, I have a thing service that is in charge of managing things. And I'm just saying, I need one of those. So Angular will give it to me when it instantiates my component. The way that I interact with my thing service is through its API. And this shows off another feature of Angular 2 called observables that I mentioned earlier. The way that observables work is they're very similar to uh, promises. The only thing that's really different is that uh, an observable can admit multiple values. And what I'm saying here is I'm interested in things. And uh, I say get things, which returns an observable that I subscribe to. And that function that I use in subscribe is just going to be invoked however often whatever thing service does has information about things to give me. So it's totally a black box to me as the user of thing service. All I'm doing is saying, hey, thing service, I'm interested in things. And I don't, I don't really care how it works behind the scenes. So I kind of like that API. It expresses the intent pretty well. It's pretty clean. I, I kind of dig it. So all I'm doing is saying, anytime there's things coming back from the thing service, uh, I, I just chose this structure to be on a data attribute of this result that comes back. And I'm just setting my things to the data coming back from thing service. And that makes it work anytime that happens. And it's basically thing service job to emit new things. And that's why, you know, when I make a new thing in one browser, it shows up in another. Is because thing service is aware of how to do that. Um, the add thing. And that shows off a couple features of, of Angular that I haven't shown you yet either. Um, add thing is basically just creating a new thing and scribing, subscribing to the specific result of creating a new thing. Um, I'm actually not doing anything with the result there other than logging it to the console. And that is because the approach that I've chosen to use here is I'm creating a new thing. I want to know that it worked correctly. But I'm relying on the fact that I'm subscribed to all the things to actually give me my update in the UI. So I'm basically saying, here's a new thing as long as it worked out if I, I don't really care anymore. And I know that wherever I'm interested in things, I'm subscribed to any changes, and I'll just see it. So that's why it works in one browser, but it works in multiple browsers too. Um, this is the basic UI for the screen. This is the app.html. And I think I only have one component in this app. And there's a couple of new things worth showing here. We've seen looping over stuff already. That's pretty simple. Uh, but there's two things we haven't seen. This is two-way binding. 
That weird syntax there uh, where I have the square brackets and the parentheses is two-way binding. And the reason that they went with that syntax is it's basically saying square brackets are one-way binding and parentheses are all about events. So basically I'm saying like binding data down and parentheses are like actions up. So it's really kind of that same data down, actions up idea that other frameworks have pioneered, mainly Ember. Um, so that's how to say two-way binding in Angular 2, and it's basically saying I'm binding that input to the new thing's name. And this is event binding, which we also haven't seen yet. Event binding is with the parentheses around the attribute. And it's basically saying the click event of this component and components can establish their own kind of events. This just happens to be a built-in event. On the click event, invoke add thing. And add thing we saw just delegates to the thing service to add a thing. So any questions on those bits so far? All right. So last, let's actually see um, the thing service and how it's created. Um, so there's one more, I don't know if this is uh, worth going through or not, but I mentioned dependency injection. <coughs> and um, for the most part, dependency injection can be very, very simple. You can basically say, if I have a class, Angular will just instantiate that class as a singleton and inject it wherever you say that you need one. That's like the simplest form of dependency injection. But in this case, I'm doing something a little bit more complex. And I'm saying here, anytime somebody asks for a Phoenix Channels instance, I want you to create it like this. And I'm saying this use factory is just takes an anonymous function. And rather than having it just construct an instance for me, I'm saying, I got that. And I want to construct an instance where I'm passing in the URL to my backend. So this is the way you create a configurable dependency in Angular 2. It, it, it's not too bad. One quick question about dependency injection. Do they still have a minification problem, or did they fix that? Um, I'm going to punt and say no. Um, I'm trying to think through that, though. I, I thought they said they were going to do something really sexy. I think, I mean, the way that you import and export things in Angular 2 is all based on the module system of JavaScript. So if, if the module system of JavaScript importing and exporting and whatever transpiler you're using can deal with that correctly and survive minification, then you should be good. In this case, I'm using System.js. System.js turns it into the system register format and that all uses strings, so that's completely minification safe. So, as best I understand it, yeah, everything should be cool. Um, so, the thing service is the last bit of this app to walk through, and it's actually one of my favorite things. No pun intended. So, thing service, uh, is a dependency that has dependencies. Um, components are automatically participating in dependency injection, but if I write my own class, I need to tell Angular, hey, I want you to inject with dependencies for this class, and that's what injectable does. It's just another uh, decorator. And I import it over here, and in the constructor I'm saying, I need access to the HTTP provider, and I need access to Phoenix channels. And when thing service is constructed, it's grabbing Phoenix channels and grabbing the channel things colon all, which is just a channel for if you're interested in changes to all the things. Uh, and I'm subscribing, uh, oh, I'm just joining the channel over here. Join just basically, yeah, he joins the channel. That, that's really it. There's nothing much to talk about here. Um, get things is where really the awesome thing about observables becomes clear to me. 
Um, so observables are composable. And they're composable via a bunch of different operations. I can take an observable and map. So I'm saying basically anytime somebody emits from the original observable, I want to do something to transform the result and then pass that on to somebody else. So basically I can, I can have a consumer that subscribes to an observable uh, that's you know, mapped from another observable farther up the chain. And that's really cool. And I do that here in this HTTP observable. I'm basically saying HTTP.get, this call here returns an observable that I subscribe to to get back the result of an HTTP request. But I'm saying, well, that's a little raw. What I really want to do is get back the, the deserialized JSON from that request. And this map call will do that. That map says, uh, take that observable and it, create a new observable based on doing this to transform the result each time. Observables are lazy in that they don't do anything until somebody subscribes to them. Uh, so if you use like functional languages, you can like closure, you can think about it like this being a sequence. Um, trying to think of the elixir equivalent, somebody help me out. Just streams, sorry, streams, I thought of it, okay. So um, lazy sequences, laziness in closure, streams in elixir, this is the same ID showing up in JavaScript and it's quite powerful. So this is taking one observable and mapping and creating a new one. Um, the other thing that you can do is merge two observables. And that's what I'm actually doing in this method and it really made me super happy. Um, I'm calling one observable here that says, I want to take that things channel and observe the message change. Anytime Phoenix channels emit a change message, I wanna know about it. And I'm taking this HTTP observable and I'm saying, you know, I want to convert the JSON. And then I'm calling something called observable.merge that takes those two observables and merges them into one. I've created my API in such a way that both observables end up emitting the exact same structure, which is just an object with a data attribute that is my thing. And basically saying, hey, whoever subscribes to get things, he doesn't care whether it came in via the initial fetch from the HTTP or later on as a result of coming in over that channel. He doesn't have to care, and that's what's awesome. All he's saying is, I'm interested in things. So observables made this like really, I, I was really super, this is one of the things I was most excited about uh, in terms of how this code turned out. So sorry if I'm getting too fired up, but it, it really made me happy. <laughs> um, uh, so that's, um, I don't know, that's one of my favorite things, like I said. Add thing, um, he's just doing a post which we haven't seen yet. He sets up his headers to say this is application JSON uh, and this is just doing a post request and sending back the results. So there's nothing too exciting here, but any questions on that? How am I doing on time? I got about five minutes left till the hour. Um, so I might go over time a little bit if people can stay, great. If you need to go, that's cool too. But any questions on this bit so far? Okay, cool. Question. Yes? So can you get back to the app class? I can. Let's, um, so let's say it takes some time to like fetch the initial data. Mm -hmm. Like how would you do like a loading, you know, like a loading icon here? Like, um, so, I think I would basically have, well, the simplest way that I can think of off the top of my head is I could have a conditional that basically says, are things empty? And just an ng if that displayed a loading, and that would just change when it got things. So th there's probably a more elegant way to do it, but. And there might be a way to, there might be a way to do something with observables, and maybe there's a state there, or something magical I could hook into, but I don't know the answer to that yet. Any other questions on that, this, things? Okay. Um, so that's not actually where I wanted to go. I wanted to see where I'm at. So I've talked about dependency injection. I've talked about observables. The next thing I wanna show you is uh, routing and upgrade adapter. 
Um, I don't know if I'll get through both of those, but uh, <clears throat> Angular 2 routing is all about components as well, and it has something called routable. You basically, components are routable too, and I'll show you what that means. And the way that I'm going to do that is not in the Things app. Uh, I don't know what you're asking me. Go away. Uh, what I'm going to do now is actually go into the Angular 2 code itself. Um, so Angular 2 ships with a playground, which basically has um, a bunch of examples inside of it. And um, all you need to do to look at those examples and play with them is pull down Angular 2, the code, run npm install, Make sure you have gulp. I mean, there's some instructions. Actually, I have a blog post walking you through it, but the key bit there is at the end of it, you run gulp serve.js.dev. It will fire up a server on port 8000, and you can actually go into the playground of example apps and poke around, and you can change things, and it'll recompile. It's really, really slow to load the first time because it's building all of Angular from source, uh, which takes a, a few minutes. Um, but it's still pretty cool that you can like see their example apps and even stuff that's completely undocumented, like the router, you can actually figure out how it works from the examples. So I've been having a lot of fun with that. Um, so let me open my editor inside of Angular 2. And uh, we will walk through this app called Inbox. So I think, let's, let's look at the app itself first and then I'll show you the code. Uh, my browser's freaking out. I don't know why. So when you start out that server and go to localhost 8000, let me bump that. Oh, that's a little too much. You'll see this playground directory. That's where you want to go to see all the examples that shipped with Angular 2. And in that source folder is the apps themselves. And the routing example has this pretend inbox thing. And you can go click on a message, and you'll see the route change to pound detail two. You can go to drafts, and it'll go to slash drafts. So this is using simple hash-based routing in an Angular 2 app. And let's see what the code for this looks like. Uh, this inbox app is in this routing folder over here. And we'll it's got a bunch of code in it, but we're going to start at the bottom because that's where routing <coughs> is configured. So the way that routing works in Angular 2, you have an annotation on your component called route config, which basically says this is a routable component. And I'm saying here are the routes and the routes route to other components. So I'm saying with the slash route, I want to use the inbox components, inbox CMP. With drafts, I want to show the drafts component, drafts CMP. And with this route, which is actually going to a message, I want to go to inbox detail. So. That's the way you define your routes. You basically have a path and you have a component. Where's the bootstrap? Uh, like in the first place? Um, so in this case with the, um, they're actually doing something in there to kick off the bootstrap that they have common for all the examples. And I haven't dug in and figured out where that's going on, to be honest. But um, based on kind of inference, oh, let's see. No, it's right here. OK. I'm a liar. So this is, yeah, so this is kicking off inbox app. The other thing that you have to do is actually, and I'm glad you said that. Thank you, because this gives me a chance to show off another piece of router 
I need to actually tell it what routing strategy to use. Uh, in this case, I'm saying just route based on the hash event, and that's why it uses hash instead of HTML5. So the, the you know, anchor pound syntax. Um, so what I wanted to show, um, so this is the config for the route. One more thing I wanted to show, the inbox app inside of his template. Um, one thing that I haven't mentioned yet, um, inside of a component, you need to specify the directives you want to be able to use within that, which I feel like is a little tedious, but that's just the way it works as far as I can tell. Um, and in this case, I'm saying I want to be able to use a router outlet and router link directive inside of my template. And that lets me say inside of inbox.html, that router outlet says, here's where the results of the route change should go. So what that's going to do is when I change routes, it will load a given component into that location on the template. That component itself could have routes and they could be nested on down a chain. Uh, I haven't done anything with nested routes, so uh, I don't have an example to show you there. But because it's a tree of components, you could really go as deep as you wanted to. Um, so that's router outlet. The other thing that we have going on here is the router link. And those are just links to slash inbox and slash drafts. I'm not really clear on why they have this kind of awkward syntax. Uh, I feel like they're going to try to try to simplify that as they go along. Um, but the other thing that I did want to show you is how uh, parameters come in. Uh, down at the bottom, I had this detail route with an ID parameter. And the way that works is in inbox detail. Let's go find him. Yeah. In inbox detail, in his constructor, I declare a pendency on the route param service. And route params lets me get a param by its name. So this is what lets me get the ID that I'm, I'm loading the detail about. So that's routing. And it's 103. Any questions about routing? If not, I'll jump in and show the upgrade example really, really quick, and then we'll call it a day. Um, so the upgrade API, there's an example that this is actually like a hybrid Angular 2, Angular 1 app. And you see that you can tell going on that upgrade app has an ng controller on it. So that kind of gives you a clue right off the bat that, hey, this is like something weird. And the way upgrading works when you have a, an app that you're transitioning from Angular 1 to Angular 2 is you use something called the upgrade adapter. Upgrade adapter, um, I guess it's worth pointing out a couple of things. The first thing that you want to do even before you try to upgrade your Angular 1 app to Angular 2 is write it in, in ECMAScript 6 and organize it in modules. You're going to want to do that anyway. It's just the way that the JavaScript community is going. And there's really no, no way to, you know, you just have to bite the bullet and do that, I guess is what I'm telling you. But once you do, you can start gradually upgrading pieces of your app to Angular 2. So um, importing the upgrade adapter is the first step. And then you actually are using Angular 1 inside of here. So I'm grabbing Angular from that folder over there. I'm making an upgrade adapter. And then I'm writing an Angular 1 app by calling angular.module. So the same way, you know, it's, it's just a, an Angular 1 app, nothing special here. And here, I'm creating a couple Angular 1 bits. I'm creating a controller and a directive. 
Now, down here, I have some Angular 2 components, pane and the outer upgrade app components. And here's where we actually start to see this adapter in action. The key things that adapter will do, they will upgrade ng1 components so that I can use an ng Angular 1 directive inside of an Angular 2 components. They will also downgrade an ng2 component so that I can use an ng2 component inside of an Angular 1 component. So that lets me up, choose my upgrade path however I want. Uh, I can start from the outside or I can start from the inside. Um, the last remaining bit of this puzzle, um, there's an adapter method that will let, let me uh, have dependencies so that uh, my existing Angular 1 services can be provided to Angular 2 components as well. I don't think there's an example of this code base. Um, but you do bootstrap an Angular, uh, an upgrading app a little bit differently. This adapter.bootstrap, you'll see that's like a little bit different than the existing bootstrap call. Uh, you do have to start with an Angular 1 module that's kind of the root of the app itself. So basically, you'd, you'd take an existing Angular 1 app, you'd run it through the upgrade adapter, and then you'd choose how to gradually move to Angular 2. That would kind of be the upgrade path. So I think that's most of what I have to tell you guys about. Um, I realize it's a bunch of stuff real fast, but um, it's really easy to dig into that Angular 2 code base to, to fire up the playground and, and look around yourself. And, that's definitely what I would encourage you guys to do. Um, and we'll, we'll probably be doing a training class in the next few months as it really gets to beta and uh, go into lots more detail. But uh, questions on any of this? Any of this you want me to poke around more on? I have a question. It's not exactly what I haven't even talked about yet, but it's kind of an issue I deal with in Angular 1. I'm kind of curious if you found if they've tackled this. And sure. It comes down to like lazy loading. I've got some, some pages and things where I have components that are just semantically specific to that page. Uh -huh. and maybe some that are semantically specific to those components as well. Mm -hmm. And it's irritating to have to bootstrap everything up at the beginning. Like, if there's a small app, that's not a big deal. But what if I've got a big app with hundreds of pages? I don't have to load a hundred of pages in if my users only looking at one or two of them, right? And, and there's a lot of stuff that's specific to pages that they're not even looking at. So off the top of my head, I mean, the, I think your problem might be solved just by the, the fact that you're using the ES2015 module system. Like if you have a component that only needs a few other components, just import those and don't import the ones you don't want. So, so the thing is though, like, and, and maybe this is fine on, on the front end, but like some of these components are on the server, right? And I haven't downloaded them yet, right? And I don't want to download unless the user is actually going to use it. Yeah. Right? And so right now, you have to do all this hack stuff with Angular to make that work because after you've done the bootstrap, it's like, oh, no more controllers allowed, no more directives allowed. Like, you have to, like, do all this hacky stuff to add directives and stuff after the fact. And it's just a pain in the butt. And so it would be great if I could say, oh, if we went to this page, get this directive from the server, bring it down, and, and register it so I can use it on this page. Versus, versus you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have an example of that off the top of my head. Um, it, it would certainly, you'd start getting into what module loader you're using. Some of the job would be the module loader, some of the job would be <coughs> Angular itself. I, I think you probably could, but I don't have an example to show you there. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry, this, we're done. I wanna go meet uh, Jeff's new baby. So thanks, everybody. Um.